Welcome to the Introduction to Environmental Policies from the Macroeconomic Perspective module, with a specific focus on content from the greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, and energy literature. We recommend doing this module alongside the other CGE modeling-related courses, namely climate change modeling, GHG emissions modeling, and environmental modeling. The Introduction to Energy Economics module should ideally also be completed before or alongside this module, as they are very complementary in nature. In this module, you will be exposed to the basics of environmental economics, different environmental indicators, the main data on energy balances and emissions, and some of the different policy instruments designed and used in macroeconomic analysis to combat climate change and study environmental economics. We also provide some examples of how environmental policies have been studied and implemented within the CGE modeling context. For practical reasons, we do not consider issues or modeling strategies related to water pollution, soil degradation, or waste management in this module, although their importance to environmental outcomes are recognized. This is broadly how this course is planned. One, an introduction to environmental economics concepts. Two, economics and climate change. Three, energy balances and emissions database. Four, policy instruments and technologies to reduce emissions. Five, a discussion on different environmental policy instruments, their economic key mechanism and impacts. Six, modeling methods in the environmental economics literature. And seven, Examples of CGE modeling applications in the literature. The main purpose of this module is to introduce and expose students to various topics on environmental economics, including climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, energy balances and emissions databases, understanding various policy instruments and technologies used to reduce emissions, learning some stylized facts about environmental issues and discussing some basics on how to model environmental policies within a CGE framework. The other modules in this series, noted earlier, are again suggested as good accompaniments to this course. The goal is to provide students with a set of tools to approach basic questions in environmental economics and to be able to argue factually and logically about these issues from an economic point of view. This section deals with basic concepts related to environmental economics, including climate change, from a macroeconomic perspective. As noted earlier, whilst this module introduces environmental policy concepts, which can be applied to a broad range of such problems, our focus in this presentation is mainly on greenhouse gas emissions and carbon tax policy examples, and excludes topics directly related to water, land, or waste. Environmental economics is a sub-discipline of economics that applies the values and tools of mainstream macroeconomics and microeconomics to allocating environmental resources more efficiently. Environmental economics studies the socioeconomic and financial impact of environmental policies. It also determines the theoretical or empirical effects of these policies on the economy. This field of economics helps users design appropriate environmental policies and analyze the effects and merits of existing or proposed policies. The basic argument behind environmental economics is that environmental goods have economic value and that there are environmental costs or externalities of economic growth that go unaccounted for in the current market model. Policies in this regard, such as carbon taxes or various forms of regulation, are subsequently studied. Environmental goods, including things like access to clean water and air, the survival of wildlife, and maintaining the climate. A closely related field is natural resource economics, which specifically focuses on demand, supply, and allocation of given natural resources to achieve the sustainable use thereof. The goal of environmental economics is to balance economic activity and the environmental impacts by considering all the costs and benefits, both direct and indirect. This form of economics takes into account pollution and natural resources depletion, 
which the current model of market systems fails to do. This failure needs to be addressed by correcting prices so that they take into account external costs. External costs are uncompensated side effects of human actions. For example, if a stream is polluted by runoff from agricultural land, the people downstream suffer a negative external cost or externality. Environmental economics aims at pricing the negative externalities that are causing environmental damage and contributing to climate change. The assumption in environmental economics is that the environment provides resources, renewable and non-renewable, assimilates waste, and provides aesthetic pleasure to humans. These are economic functions because they have positive economic value and could be bought and sold in the marketplace. However, traditionally, this value has not been recognized because there is often no market for these services to establish a price, which is why economists talk about market failure. One of the main issues in environmental economics today is the choice and design of policies dealing with climate change and mitigating GHG emissions to reduce its impact. This section covers key concepts related to climate change, the main global institutions, and agreements that focus on overseeing the mitigation of climate change, its relevance, and the current state of climate change. These instruments can be applied to other environmental problems not specifically covered in this module, such as problems with water, land, and waste. One of the main issues that environmental economics deals with and that environmental policies at the macroeconomic level focus on is climate change. Climate change includes both global warming driven by human-induced emissions of greenhouse gases and the resulting large-scale shifts in weather patterns. Though there have been previous periods of climatic change, since the mid-20th century humans have had an unprecedented impact on Earth's climate system and caused change on a global scale. Two main definitions of climate change can be used. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, defines climate change as the change in the state of the climate that can be identified, for example using statistical tests, by changes in the mean and or the variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period, typically decades or longer. It refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, defines climate change as the change of climate that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is, in addition to natural climate variability, observed over comparable time periods. Climate change primarily results from the increase in greenhouse gas emissions, GHGs, that create a greenhouse effect. More than 90% of these GHGs are carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4. Fossil fuel burning, coal, oil, and natural gas, for energy consumption is the main source of these emissions with additional contributions from agriculture, deforestation, and manufacturing. Climate change threatens people with food insecurity, water scarcity, flooding, infectious diseases, extreme heat, economic losses, and displacement. These human impacts have led the World Health Organization to call climate change the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. Even if efforts to minimize future warming are successful, some effects will continue for centuries, including rising sea levels, rising ocean temperatures, and ocean acidification. The Modeling the Impacts of Climate Change on Agriculture in PEP1T module focuses on how to specifically model climate change impacts within a CGE modeling framework. This is a good module to do after you have successfully completed this one. The main goal with regards to climate change mitigation worldwide is to keep the average global temperature rise well below 2 degrees Celsius and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels.
The global average temperature has already increased by around one degree over the last decade, underlying the urgency of action if we are to stay as close as possible to the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. For environmental economists and policymakers worldwide, it is of utmost importance to create binding policies that will ensure that we meet the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. The main institutions and agreements overseeing that this goal is achieved are the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. The UNFCCC aims to prevent dangerous human interference with the climate. It entered into force on March 21, 1994. Today, it has near universal membership. The 197 countries that have ratified the convention are called parties to the convention. The ultimate objective of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic human-induced interference with the climate system. It states that such a level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. The IPCC is the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. The IPCC was created to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments on climate change, its implications, and potential future risks as well as to put forward adaptation and mitigation options. The Kyoto Protocol was created to operationalize the UNFCCC by committing industrialized countries and economies in transition to limit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions GHGs, in accordance with agreed-upon individual targets. The Convention itself only asks those countries to adopt policies and measures on mitigation and to report periodically. The Kyoto Protocol was adopted on December 11, 1997. Owing to a complex ratification process, it entered into force on February 16, 2005. There was a total of 192 parties signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. This protocol set binding emission reduction targets for 37 industrialized countries and economies in transition and the European Union. Overall, these targets were supposed to add up to an average 5% emission reduction compared to 1990 levels over the five-year period of 2008 to 2012, the first commitment period. The Paris Agreement often referred to as the Paris Accords or the Paris Climate Accords, is an international treaty on climate change created in 2015. It covers climate change mitigation, adaptation, and finance. The agreement was negotiated by 196 parties at the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference near Paris, France. The Paris Agreement, which aims to keep global warming well below 1.5 degrees Celsius, the agreement replaced the Kyoto Protocol. Unlike Kyoto, no binding emission targets were set in the Paris Agreement. Instead, the procedure of regularly setting ever more ambitious goals and re-evaluating these goals every five years has been made binding. Human activities are estimated to have caused approximately 1 degree Celsius of global warming above pre-industrial levels, with a likely range of 0 0.8 degrees to 1.2 degrees Celsius. Global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate. Warming from anthropogenic emissions from the pre-industrial period to the present will persist for centuries to millennia and will continue to cause further long-term changes in the climate system, such as sea level rise. Climate-related risks for natural and human systems are higher for a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius than at present, but lower than at 2 degrees Celsius. These risks depend on the magnitude and rate of warming geographical location, levels of development and vulnerability, 
and on the choices and implementation of adaptation and mitigation options. Climate models, as presented by the IPCC, project robust differences in regional climate characteristics between present day, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, and between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees Celsius. These differences include increases in mean temperature in most land and ocean regions, hot extremes in most inhabited regions, heavy precipitation in several regions, and the probability of drought and precipitation deficits in some regions. Impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems, including species loss and extinction, are projected to be lower at a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees Celsius. Limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is projected to lower the impacts of terrestrial, freshwater, and coastal ecosystems and to retain more of their services to humans. This limit is projected to reduce risks to marine biodiversity, other ecosystems, and their functions and services to humans. As well, climate-related risks to health, livelihoods, food and human security, water supply, and economic growth are projected to increase significantly if the 1.5 degrees Celsius target is exceeded. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed our atmosphere, oceans, and lands. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, oceans, cryospheres, and biospheres have occurred. Each of the last four decades have been warmer than any decade that preceded it since 1850. Global surface temperatures in the first two decades of the 21st century, from 2001 to 2020, were 0.99 degrees higher than from 1850 to 1900. These temperatures were 1.09 degrees higher than from 2011 to 2020, than from 1850 to 1900, with larger increases over land, 1.59 degrees higher than over the ocean, 0.88 degrees higher. Panel A shows changes in global surface temperatures reconstructed from paleoclimate archives, the solid gray line from year 1 to 2000. From direct observations, the solid black line for the years 1850 to 2020 averaged over decades. The vertical bar on the left shows the estimated temperature range during the warmest multi-century period in at least the last 100,000 years which occurred around 6,500 years ago during the current interglacial period, the Holocene. The last interglacial period, around 125,000 years ago, is the next most recent candidate for a period of higher temperatures. These past warm periods were caused by slow, multimillennial orbital variations. The gray shading with white diagonal lines shows the very likely ranges for the temperature reconstructions. Panel B shows changes in global surface temperatures over the past 170 years, the black line, relative to the years 1850 to 1900, annually averaged. This is compared to the CMIP-6 climate model simulations of the temperature response to both human and natural drivers, brown, and to only natural drivers, solar and volcanic activity, green. Solid colored lines show the multi-model average, and colored shades show the very likely range of simulations. These three figures show the assessed contributions to observed global warming from 2010 to 2019 relative to the years 1850 to 1900. Panel A is the observed global warming, or increases in global surface temperatures, and its likely range. Panel B shows evidence from attribution studies, which synthesizes information from climate models and observations. The panel shows temperature changes attributed to total human influences, changes in well-mixed greenhouse gas emission concentrations, other human influences of aerosols, ozone and land use changes, land use reflectance, solar and volcanic drivers, and internal climate variability. Whiskers show the likely ranges. Panel C shows evidence from the assessment of radiative forcing and climate sensitivity.
The panel shows temperature changes from individual components of human influence, including emissions of greenhouse gases, aerosols and their precursors, land use changes, land use reflectance and irrigation, and aviation contrails. Whiskers show the likely ranges. Estimates account for both direct emissions into the atmosphere and their effects, if any, on other climate drivers. So far, we have considered various basic aspects of environmental economics, climate change, and mitigation. But we did not consider one important aspect directly, the effect of the energy sector on the environment. This is addressed in this session. In it, we present an overview of the energy-environment interactions and introduce the economic instruments for dealing with such problems. Economic activities make use of resources and other inputs, such as labor, capital, etc., to transform them into usable outputs. The production and consumption process generates waste, which is put into the environment. Similarly, the living beings on Earth use air and water provided by the environment for sustaining life. The environment thus provides a number of services to facilitate economic activities. These include a resource base, which can be put to extractive or amenity uses. These are similar to non-renewable energies that are consumed once and are finite. A life support system through the provision of air and water and a waste sink where the wastes of the production process are put. These wastes can be in solid, liquid, or gaseous forms. These resources and services are scarce in nature, and increased use of these facilities risks the danger of deteriorating the quality of the environment. When the environment is used as a receptor of wastes, there is a limit up to which it can absorb the wastes and assimilate it into its system. This capacity is known as the absorptive capacity or assimilative capacity. Beyond this capacity, the wastes accumulate in the environment and the concentration of waste levels increases with the addition of new wastes. The environmental problem starts when the waste output crosses the assimilative capacity of the environment. As the users who do not create the problem are not often responsible for bearing the cost of the damage, it creates an externality as well. Environmental pollution can be caused by natural phenomena, known as biogenic sources of pollution, or from human activities, known as anthropogenic sources. Different activities in the energy system, production, conversion, and utilization, lead to various environmental impacts. These energy-environmental interactions are at different levels. The household level. A variety of energy services are used ranging from cooking to lighting and heating and cooling. At one end, biomass-based fuel is used, while at the other end, modern energies such as natural gas and electricity are used to satisfy the energy needs. Historically, it is found that people tend to move up the ladder of higher fuel quality as their incomes increase. A population larger than 2.5 billion is still dependent on poor quality traditional energies for household needs, IEA 2017. The different fuels used at the household level lead to different environmental impacts. For example, fuel wood harvesting contributes to depletion of forests and combustion of household fuels leads to air pollution. The community level. At this level, the major environmental impact of energy use is felt on the level of urban pollution, although industrial and other activities also contribute to this. Combustion of fuels, either in power generating stations, in industry, in residential or commercial activities, and use of energy for transportation are the major sources of urban air pollution. The regional level. This can be viewed as an intermediate level of impact somewhere between local and global level problems. The regional problems include acid rain issues, tropospheric ozone and suspended fine particles. The regional impact is due to transportation of pollutants over long distances via wind and other climactic conditions. And global level problems. Continued reliance on fossil fuels has increased CO2 emissions globally.
with the exception of 2020, which saw carbon emissions from energy use falling by over 6% due to COVID-19, the largest fall since 1945, BP, 2021. There has been an increasing trend of CO2 emissions from fossil fuels, with these emissions increasing at a faster rate from developing countries than that of developed countries. Although CO2 emissions per person is much lower in the non-OECD economies due to a higher population base, the issue of limiting emissions becomes important when most of the incremental emissions are expected to come from a few large developing economies. However, given the low per capita emission level in these countries and their need for economic growth to sustain a reasonable quality of life, it would be difficult to impose any binding commitment on them. This makes the climate issue even more challenging. At a global scale, the GHGs emitted by human activities are carbon dioxide, CO2. Fossil fuel use is the primary source of CO2. It can also be emitted from direct human-induced impacts on forestry and other land use such as through deforestation, land clearing for agriculture, and degradation of soils. Likewise, land use can also remove CO2 from the atmosphere through reforestation, improvement of soils, and other activities. Methane, CH4. Agricultural activities, waste management, energy use, and biomass burning all contribute to CH4 emissions. Nitrous oxide, N2O. Agricultural activities, such as fertilizer use, are the primary source of N2O emissions. Fossil fuel combustion also generates N2O. Fluorinated gases, F gases, industrial processes, refrigeration, and the use of a variety of consumer products contribute to emissions of F gases, which include hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, perfluorocarbons, PFCs, and sulfur hexafluoride, SF6. The figure clearly shows that emissions coming from CO2 within the fossil fuel and industrial processes are the major contributors, representing 65%, to GHGs globally. Global GHGs can also be broken down by the economic activities that lead to their production. Electricity and heat production representing 25% of 2010 global greenhouse gas emissions. The burning of coal, natural gas, and oil for electricity and heat is the largest single source of global GHG emissions. Industry, 21%. Greenhouse gas emissions from industries primarily involve fossil fuels burned on site at facilities for energy. This sector also includes emissions from chemical, metallurgical and mineral transformation processes not associated with energy consumption and emissions from waste management activities. Note, emissions from industrial electricity use are excluded and are instead covered in the electricity and heat production sector. Agriculture, forestry and other land use, 24%. GHG emissions from this sector come mostly from agriculture, the cultivation of crops and livestock, and deforestation. This estimate does not include the CO2 that ecosystems remove from the atmosphere by sequestering carbon in biomass, dead organic matter, and soils, which offset approximately 20% of emissions from this sector. Transportation, 14%. Greenhouse gas emissions from this sector primarily involve fossil fuels burned for road, rail, air, and marine transportation. Almost all, 95%, of the world's transportation energy comes from petroleum-based fuels, largely gasoline and diesel. Buildings, 6%. Greenhouse gas emissions from this sector arise from on-site energy generation and burning fuels for heat in buildings or cooking in homes. Note, emissions from electricity use in buildings are excluded and are instead covered in the electricity and heat production sector. Other energy, 
This source of greenhouse gas emissions refers to all emissions from the energy sector which are not directly associated with electricity or heat production, such as fuel extraction, refining, processing, and transportation. The figure shows that emissions coming from electricity and heat production are the major contributors, 25%, to GHG globally. The Environmental Kuznets Curve, EKC, suggests an inverted U relationship between per capita pollution and per capita income. Such a relationship suggests that in the initial phase of increasing per capita income, the citizens may be willing to accept a poor environmental quality, but as the income improves, a turning point will be reached and the demand for a better environment will arise. Increases in wealth will lead to further reduction in the environmental pollution. If such a relationship holds, economic growth will cure the environmental problem and the damage may be a transitional one. The economic logic behind the EKC suggests that as developing countries would demand more energy to drive economic growth, an important policy issue arises whether they should follow the industrial country's policy of polluting first and cleaning later, or leapfrog towards cleaner technologies and avoid the mess in the first place. In a simple perspective, in the early stages of economic growth, degradation of the environment and pollution increases, but beyond some level of income per capita, which will vary for different indicators, the trend reverses so that, at high income levels, economic growth leads to environmental improvement. This implies that the environmental impact indicator is an inverted U-shaped function of income per capita. Typically, the logarithm of the indicator is modeled as a quadratic function of the logarithm of income. The figure in this slide provides an example of an EKC. The EKC is named for Simon Kuznets, who hypothesized that income inequality first rises and then falls as economic development proceeds. Supporters of the environmental Kuznets curve argue that generally, if there is no change in the economic structure or technology use, economic growth leads to proportional increases in the environmental effect, known as the scale effect. However, economic development normally happens in stages. Initially, agricultural activities dominate, which is followed by industrialization of the economy, and finally, a shift towards the information and service-oriented activities takes place. This structural change, along with better environmental awareness, technological changes, and better environmental management initiatives, improves the environment. Critics of the environmental Kuznets curve state that, one, there is no standard shape or relationship that is valid for all pollutants or for all regions. Two, the result is highly dependent on the econometric method used and the data analyzed. Different researchers have reported different results for the same pollutant, indicating the lack of robustness of the results. Three, the research that finds such relationships are unable to explain the process through which the curve takes place. Four, the estimation often ignores the feedback from environmental damage to economic activities. If the environmental damage is sufficiently strong, it is likely that the economic activity will be affected and therefore ignoring this does not provide a correct picture. Peer-reviewed research conducted by Stern 2004, concluded that there is no strong evidence that countries follow a common inverted U-shaped pathway for environmental damage as their income rises, suggesting that it may take decades before reaching the trend inversion, and accordingly, waiting for such times will not make sense. Proactive policies and measures would be required to mitigate the environmental problem. What is undisputed is that GHG emissions have increased over time in both the developed and developing world, and CO2 emissions are the main driver of these emissions. This session provides a short description of both energy balances and the emissions database. 
Please note that a detailed explanation of energy balances and its components has been provided in the Introduction to Energy Economics module. Additionally, the Extending the PEP-1T with Environmental Aspects modules shows, in detail, where to find environmental data and how to add it to the PEP-1T CGE model. In this module, we focus on highlighting the importance and relevance of energy balances and emissions databases towards a macroeconomic policy that targets emissions mitigation. Energy balances can be defined as an accounting framework for compilation of data on all energy products entering, exiting, and used within the national territory of a given country during a reference period. An energy balance helps us understand how products are transformed into one another, highlights the various relationships among these products, and shows how all energy types are ultimately used. Key data in the balances includes total primary energy supply, TPES, total final consumption, TFC, and data on electricity generation by fuel type. TPES shows the overall energy supply available for use in a country, while TFC shows the energy that is actually used by final consumers, the energy used in homes, transportation, and businesses. The electricity output data shows the relative weights of all forms of energy in the generation mix. Therefore, in TFC, the electricity product includes electricity generated from all the various energy sources, while in TPES, only the corresponding primary equivalent amounts are included for each generation source. The energy balance presents all the data in a common energy unit. This allows users to see the total amount of energy used and the relative contribution of each different source for the whole economy and for each individual consumption sector. In addition, it allows users to compute the various energy transformation efficiencies to develop several aggregated indicators, for example, consumption per capita or per unit of GDP, and to estimate CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. Why do we focus on energy balances? Because they help in bringing all the pieces of information together. They allow us to identify country-specific energy circumstances. They provide an accurate accounting of all energy flows, which is essential to calculate emissions. They supply energy indicators, which help in calculating the carbon intensity of the energy mix. They are key in allowing for the estimation of GHG emissions. They allow us to identify the main sectors driving GHG emissions and they help us in understanding country-specific drivers of emissions. An emission database slash inventory is an accounting of the amount of pollutants discharged into the atmosphere. It usually contains the total emissions for one or more specific greenhouse gases or air pollutants originating from all source categories in a certain geographical area and within a specified time span, usually a specific year. Information on emissions is an absolute requirement in understanding environmental problems and in monitoring progress towards solving these. Emission inventories provides this type of information. Emission inventories are compiled for both scientific applications and for use in policy processes. For policy use, they track progress towards emission reduction targets and help to develop strategies and policies. For scientific use, inventories of natural and anthropogenic emissions are used by scientists as inputs to air quality models. Annual reporting of national total emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants is done as a response to obligations under international conventions and protocols. This type of emissions reporting aims at monitoring the progress towards agreed-upon national emission reduction targets. For example, annual emission inventories are reported to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, as part of the Paris Agreement. The categorization and emissions factors set by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, 
In the revised 1996 IPCC Guidelines for National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, IPCC Good Practice Guidance and Uncertainty Management in National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, IPCC Good Practice Guidance for Land Use, Land Use Change, and Forestry, more recently, the 2006 IPCC Guidelines for National Greenhouse Gas Inventories and the 2019 Refinement to the 2006 IPCC Guidelines for National Greenhouse Gas Inventories are used to compile an emission inventory. Emission inventories report on key GHG groups of pollutants. Greenhouse gases are comprised of carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, and a number of fluorinated gaseous compounds, HFCs, PFCs, and SF6. We now understand that climate change, mainly in the form of increased GHG emissions, which is explicitly reported by the IPCC, are causing the planet to warm. If global action is not taken promptly, the global economy is going to suffer. This next session focuses on presenting the main policies and measures that can be taken and modeled in order to mitigate GHG emissions. As highlighted earlier, GHG emissions have been increasing over time, and in order to combat more progressive environmental damages, GHG emissions reductions are necessary and proactive policies and measures need to happen. Emissions reductions cost money as it forces companies and households to use more expensive energy and newer technologies. However, the cost of the externalities that are causing environmental damage needs to be considered. Policies should be smart, comprehensive, and gradual. Environmental policy refers to the commitment of an organization or government to the laws, regulations, and other policy mechanisms concerning environmental issues. As discussed earlier, environmental issues refers to the human or anthropogenic impact on the environment. Environmental issues include changes to biophysical environments and to ecosystems, biodiversity, and natural resources caused directly or indirectly by humans, including global warming, environmental degradation, mass extinction and biodiversity loss, ecological crisis, and ecological collapse. Some human activities that cause damage, either directly or indirectly, to the environment on a global scale include population growth, overconsumption, overexploitation, pollution, and deforestation. Some of the problems including climate change, global warming, and biodiversity loss pose an existential risk to humans, and some experts attribute this crisis to overall human overpopulation. The rationale for governmental involvement in the environment is often attributed to market failure in the form of forces beyond the control of one person, including the free rider problem and the tragedy of the commons. Environmental policy instruments are tools used by governments and other organizations to implement their environmental policies. There's a wide variety of national policies and measures that are available to governments to limit or reduce GHG emissions and environmental damage. These include regulations and standards, taxes and charges, tradable permits, voluntary agreements, subsidies, financial incentives, research and development programs, and information instruments. Other policies, such as those affecting trade, foreign direct investment, consumption, and social development goals can also affect GHG emissions. Climate change policies, if integrated with other government policies, can contribute to sustainable development in developed and developing countries alike. More on this later. There are three key categories of instruments available to control environmental issues. One, behavior control mechanisms. These alternatives rely on regulation or incentives. Two, levels of control. Whether the instrument directly or indirectly influences the emissions. And three, 
Control variables. Three important parameters here are price, quantity, and technology. Quantity-based policies fix the level of environmental damage, but allow prices to change. On the other hand, price-based policies fix the cost of controlling environmental damage, but allow the pollution level to change in response to economic conditions. Technical solutions focus on technology-driven fixes to generate an acceptable level of damage. This leaves 10 alternative policies to reduce emissions and to control the environmental externality problem. Any policy that influences emissions is a direct policy. Examples of direct policies include emission taxes, tradable permits, and emission standards. As these policies directly target pollution, pollution measurement, monitoring, and compliance verification are essential. Direct policies appear to be most justified in environmental problems that involve large, publicly noticeable companies such as power utilities, large industries, and big mining companies, etc. Indirect policies must be relied on where direct instruments are not feasible. They influence the waste generation process, emissions per unit of input, efficiency of the conversion process, input per output, or the demand for the pollution-intensive product, output. Examples include tax on inputs, tax on related goods, product standards, etc. These policies are normally less efficient because they work only on a component of the problem. The most common economic instruments available for controlling environmental damage include fiscal instruments, taxes, property rights, and market creation, trading. Taxes and charges. A tax equal to the marginal environmental damage can be used to internalize externalities. Such a direct tax on per unit of pollution, known as Pigouvian tax, is an economically efficient mechanism of internalization. A tax on CO2 emissions or SOx or NOx emissions is a direct tax on pollution. A few countries have started such environmental taxes, but often the tax rate does not have much relation with the external cost, for example, carbon tax. There are a few issues related to Pigovian taxes. One, it requires direct measurement of pollution, which is difficult for small sources. Two, setting the tax at the appropriate level, equal to marginal damage cost, requires knowledge about the damages caused by pollution and their monetary evaluation. This is often very difficult. And three, administration of the tax system may be difficult as well. Who bears the tax burden? The tax imposed on the generator of external effect may appear to affect the generators at the first instance, but as the goods are sold in the market, consumers pay for the tax good. This might suggest that consumers ultimately bear the burden of tax. In fact, both the generators and the consumers share the burden, but the level or degree of burden sharing depends on the elasticity of demand. When the demand is inelastic, changes in prices will not affect the demand for the good. This results in transferring the burden to the consumers. On the other hand, when the demand is elastic, consumers will switch to other products and the demand will be affected substantially. In this case, the producers will bear a large share of the burden. Property rights. One of the sources of externality is the lack of well-defined property rights. The property rights approach to the externality problem attempts to work through proper redefinition and enforcement of property rights where possible. There are four types of property rights. One, privately owned. Two, state property regimes where the state has the ownership rights of the property instead of any individuals. This is the case of subsoil resources in many countries. The state is presumed to protect the collective interest of the society. However, as the state acts or exercises its ownership rights through agents, bureaucrats or officials, the motives of the agents can be different from that of the collective interests. This leads to the principal agent problem and can affect management of the state-owned properties for environmental purposes. Three, 
Common Property Resources There are some resources which are not owned privately but collectively by a number of users. This is a form of institutional arrangement for managing resources and excluding others to use the benefits. Often formal or informal rules are devised to govern the resource use. Due to multiplicity of ownership, cheating and free riding issues appear. 4. Open Access Resources No group or individual has ownership rights of the property. This implies that none has legal power to restrict access. In such a case, each user has the incentive to look at his or her total costs and benefits and not at the marginal costs and benefits. Consequently, the resource will be utilized until the total cost equals the total benefits. In a cost-benefit framework, the objective is to maximize the net gain, which occurs when marginal cost equals marginal benefit. Over-exploitation of the resource results in inefficient allocation. The Coase Theorem The fundamental theorem in the area of externality and property rights was developed by Robert Coase. The theorem states that under ideal economic conditions where there is costless bargaining between the generator and the victim of an externality, conflict of property rights, the optimum outcome will emerge so long as either party holds the pertinent property right. It does not matter which one. Pareto efficiency will occur. Tradable permits. This is a form of market creation that has been used to a limited extent compared to taxes and charges. The basic idea here is that the total quantity of emissions should not exceed the tolerable limit. Within this limit, each polluter should be free to decide how to restrict his or her emissions. Each polluter decides whether to reduce pollution or sell the permits or pollute and buy permits or pollute and pay penalties. Then, based on cost and price signals, polluters can benefit from exchanging the credits of extra emission reduction with others. The key here is that non-compliance would lead to penalties, for example cap and trade. Other. Recent evidence from the U.S. shows that mandatory carbon dioxide output reporting contributes to a reduction in emissions. Power plants owned by publicly traded firms saw CO2 reductions of 9.4% and plants owned by the government or private investors saw CO2 reductions of 6.4%. Small plants exempt from disclosure requirements saw an increase in emissions of at least 25%. With funding increasingly linked to ESG and transparency performance indicators, this may be an important option for authorities to help speed up the clean and green transition. No single instrument will satisfy all criteria, but a systematic approach can be followed to choose the best instrument. 1. Environmental Effectiveness Will the instrument achieve the environmental objective within the specified time span, and what degree of certainty can be expected? Two. Cost effectiveness. Will the instrument achieve the environmental objective at the minimum possible cost to the society? 3. Flexibility. Is the instrument flexible enough to changes in technology, the resource scarcity, and market conditions? For example, if an instrument is dependent on a particular technological choice, its effectiveness will be reduced when new technologies arrive and change monitoring, cost of compliance, and other factors. 4. Dynamic Efficiency Does the instrument provide incentive to technological innovation? Does it promote environmentally sound infrastructure and economic structure? A dynamically efficient instrument encourages flow of resources to the areas where the country has comparative advantages, promotes technological innovation, and environmentally sound infrastructure. 5. Equity Will the costs and benefits of the instruments be equitably distributed? Normally, the poor will have lower willingness to pay for environmental benefits, but being vulnerable, they may gain more from the environmental protection. The distributional impact of an instrument is an important consideration. 6. Ease of introduction. Is the instrument consistent with the country's legal framework? Does it require new legislation? If so, is it feasible?
Does the regulatory body have the requisite administrative capacity to administer new instruments? Ease of monitoring and enforcement. How difficult or costly will monitoring and enforcement be? A country with limited monitoring and enforcement capability will choose instruments requiring limited monitoring and enforcement efforts. 7. Predictability. Does the instrument combine predictability and flexibility? An instrument becomes effective if it remains in force in the long run and thus imposes predictable costs on the users. This provides better signals for investment decisions and brings desired changes. Uncertainty in unpredictable instruments reduce effectiveness. 8. Acceptability. Is the instrument understandable by the public, acceptable to the industry, and politically sellable? Finally, if the users are not able to understand an instrument, its effectiveness is expected to be lower. Similarly, acceptability to industries and politicians also affects the instrument selection. There are certain goods which are non-rivalrous in consumption and are difficult to exclude. The Earth's atmosphere and the oceans have these characteristics. They are common sources. Everybody and anybody has rights to use them. The access is not restricted. For example, they are open access resources, and nobody has to pay for the use of these resources. As is common with such properties, as nobody owns it, nobody cares for it, but everybody depends on these resources. There is an overuse and degradation of the resource which is detrimental to everyone. Thus, they are public goods in an open access property regime and constitute a classic case of externality. In addition, the climate has a global dimension. Everyone in the world pollutes the atmosphere through energy use and other activities. Similarly, the effects of the atmospheric and climate change will affect everybody as well. The global nature of the problem adds complexity in managing the problem. Here, we present specific environmental instruments that have been used to tackle the issue of climate change. The models used by the IPCC to evaluate the effects of climate change and the different global agreements to mitigate GHG emissions have followed an integrated approach. This approach combines economic development and the climate problem in an incorporated manner. Essentially, these models attempt to see the impacts of alternative socio-economic development paths on the emissions, climate, and the effects on the economy and the society. These analyses try to capture the impacts of climate on human beings and other natural systems, the costs and benefits of alternative mitigation options, the emission reductions due to these options, their impact on economic growth, and the distributional impacts. The impacts of climate change on human beings and other natural systems. The economic uncertainties when planning policies and measures to mitigate GHG emissions include how the world population and economic growth will be during the time of the assessment. What will be the composition of economic activities and how much energy will come from fossil fuels? How will the mitigation policies affect the accumulation of GHGs? How much will these policies cost? And how much will future generations value these policies? Fundamental issues are raised by the fact that climate change is a global problem. These concerns include what should be the overall reduction in GHG emissions? At what price? Who should reduce the emissions by how much and when? Should there be income transfers from high to low income groups? How do we prevent free riding and cheating? And can an international cooperative solution be achieved? Regulatory Approaches there are different types of standards which are used for environmental purposes. Energy efficiency standards are one such option for controlling GHG emissions. These standards are widely used and are growing in number. Carbon tax. The basic principle of the carbon tax is similar to the environmental taxes and charges. As climate change is a free global public good, it generates externality. 
attacks can be used to internalize the externality. As each polluter faces a uniform tax on emissions per ton of CO2 equivalent, the tax would result in a least cost solution in a first best world. However, in a real world, the first best conditions are hardly met and therefore carbon taxes may not result in a least cost solution. As climate is a free global public good, it generates externality. Tradable permits, cap and trade for example. Each participating polluter receives an allocation of permits initially, gratis or by auction. If a polluter pollutes less than the permit it holds, it can sell the excess permits to those who exceed their quota. The market price of the permits provides the signal for corrective action, whether to reduce the pollution below the allowable limit and sell the permits, or buy permits to meet the target. Voluntary Agreements, VAs. The IPCC defines them as an agreement between a government authority and one or more private parties, as well as a unilateral commitment that is recognized by the public authority to achieve environmental objectives or to improve environmental performance beyond compliance. Voluntary agreements take various forms. They can be between the government and firms or between the government and industries. VAs can relate to general issues such as R&D or energy efficiency, but they can also specify quantified targets in some cases. Most of the VAs are not legally binding. The two main macro policies used globally in practice and in literature to mitigate GHG emissions are the carbon tax and the cap and trade agreements. Here are some issues to think about with regards to these mechanisms. With carbon tax, the collection point, the tax base, the variation or uniformity among sectors, the association with trade, the employment impacts, the use of revenue slash recycling, the R&D policies, and the exact form of the mechanism. With cap and trade, the initial allocation of permits, grandparenting, give permits to victims per capita basis. With regards to international trade, with regards to technological trade, the government revenue, auction, the safety valve slash allowance borrowing. The environmental economics literature is vast, as already shown. In the next section, we will focus on a couple of papers that exhibit and discuss the most prominent modeling methods and mitigation strategies, with a focus on large-scale general equilibrium models and carbon taxes, respectively. This chapter is from the Handbook of CGE Modeling and takes an in-depth look at the modeling of environmental issues in Australia, which has a long and rich history of modeling environmental policies using CGE methods. Various prominent data and modeling issues when thinking about and designing general equilibrium policy models for environmental analysis are discussed and how we can deal with them. We highly recommend a careful read through this literature. Topics include 1. An emissions policy is policy making for the long run with the underlying global externality and many abatement options involving complex dynamics. 2. The detail in the model or data is often key to producing credible results. 3. The investment in electricity generation is typically lumpy, not smooth. 4. Emissions intensive industries, especially in the energy sector, tend to be geographically concentrated due to the availability of primary energy sources. Hence, an emissions policy will likely have significant regional effects. 5. Given the global nature of the externality problem and the policy response, the use of both single country and global CGE models may be advised. The economy-wide effects of carbon taxes and ETSs have been extensively tested using CGE models. The base case is of relatively more importance in emissions-slash-environmental policy modeling. The model's theoretical specification requires allowing for interfuel substitution in electricity generation, 
From the Australian experience, it is recommended, as discussed in the chapter, to use the technology bundle approach and introducing a weak substitution. The authors further suggest that delivering the required level of detail within the energy and electricity generation sectors is best provided by linking a detailed bottom-up model of the stationary energy sector with a single country national or regional CGE model, for example, MMRF with GTEM slash WHIRLY GIG. This chapter by Nordhaus is also from the Handbook of CGE Modeling and gives an overview of Integrated Assessment Models, IAMs. This work, for which William Nordhaus was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018, was largely based on the literature and IAMs discussed in this chapter. Integrated Assessment Models, IAMs, are complex system models designed for high-level climate environmental economic analysis. These models attempt to bring together climate change science and policy, which involve a wide variety of sciences such as atmospheric chemistry and climate sciences, ecology, economics, political science, game theory, and international law. The challenge of coping with global warming is particularly difficult because it spans many disciplines and parts of society. Ecologists may see it as a threat to ecosystems, marine biologists as a problem leading to ocean acidification, electric utilities as a debit to their balance sheets, and coal miners as an existential threat to their livelihood. Businesses may view global warming as either an opportunity or a hazard. Politicians as a great issue as long as they don't need to mention taxes. Ski resorts may view it as a mortal danger to their already short seasons. Golfers as a boon to year-round recreation and poor countries as a threat to their farmers as well as a potential source of financial and technological aid. This many-faceted nature also poses a challenge to natural and social scientists who must incorporate a wide variety of geophysical, economic, and political disciplines into their diagnoses and prescriptions. The task of integrated modeling is to pull together the different aspects of a problem so that a decision or analysis can consider all important endogenous variables that operate simultaneously. The flow chart shows schematically the important modules in the case of climate change. A complete analysis must consider emission concentrations, climate change, and the impacts from these. The last arrow in the process links the impacts and policies back to emissions, thus closing the loop. IAMs can be divided into two general classes policy optimization and policy evaluation models. Policy evaluation models generally are recursive or equilibrium models that generate paths of important variables but do not optimize an economic outcome. Policy optimization models have an objective function or welfare function that is maximized and can be used to evaluate alternative paths or policies. In models that have an economic structure, the objective function is generally a measure of economic welfare. This would typically be a set of utility functions in general equilibrium models or consumer and producer surplus in partial equilibrium models. These are not as different as might be supposed, as policy optimization models can be run in a non-policy mode, while policy evaluation models can compare different policies. However, there is often a difference in the solution algorithm as recursive models are often much simpler to solve computationally than are optimization models. IAMs have a wide variety of applications. Among the most important applications are the following. 1. Making consistent projections, for example ones that have consistent inputs and outputs of the different components of the system so that the GDP projections are consistent with the emissions projections. 2. Calculating the impacts of alternative assumptions on important variables such as output, emissions, temperature change, and impacts. 3. Tracing through the effects of alternative policies 
on all variables in a consistent manner, as well as estimating the costs and benefits of alternative strategies. 4. Estimating the uncertainties associated with alternative variables and strategies. And 5. Calculating the effects of reducing uncertainties about key parameters or variables, as well as estimating the value of research and new technologies. Issues in the construction, design, and interpretations of IAMs that need to be considered include the following. 1. The social cost of carbon. This concept represents the economic cost caused by an additional ton of carbon dioxide emissions or its equivalent. 2. Complexity and transparency. One of the major issues in all IAMs is the problem of transparency. Models are generally either scientifically acceptable and opaque or highly simplified and relatively transparent. This problem is seen in the great difficulty most researchers have had in exporting their models to other groups. 3. Positive versus normative models. One of the issues that pervades the use of IAM is whether they should be interpreted as normative or positive. In other words, should they be seen as the recommendations of a central planner, a world environment agency, or a disinterested observer incorporating a social welfare function? Or are they meant to be a description of how economies and real-world decision-makers, consumers, firms, governments, actually behave? 4. Discount Rate Controversies involving the discount rate have been central to global warming models and policies for many years. The economic theory of discounting, which has been a relatively obscure topic in public finance and project analysis, assumes great prominence in climate change IAMs because of the long delays between investments in abatement and returns in averted damages. 5. Additional issues worth noting discussed in the chapter include uncertainty for thin-tailed distributions, higher moment uncertainty, fat tails, and catastrophic climate change, strategic considerations and the game theoretic aspects of climate change policy, and modeling technological change. This paper by Metcalf, published in the Annual Review of Resource Economics, gives a comprehensive overview of carbon taxes in theory and practice. The author takes a close look at carbon taxes, which have been the dominant policy tool considered and or implemented to help reduce GHG emissions and so reduce the impacts on climate change. Carbon taxes are generally preferred to alternative measures such as cap and trade, ETS, programs due to, one, the pricing certainty carbon taxes brings, Two, the typically high administrative burden of cap-and-trade or ETS programs, and three, the potential for adverse policy interactions from ETS. The cost of climate change, including both damages and the cost of adaptation, is expected to be considerable in the coming decades. As confirmed by IPCC 2021, some impacts stemming from man-made climate change rising temperatures and extreme climate events are now irreversible, but can still be limited if emissions are significantly reduced relative to the baseline going forward. A review of the literature shows that carbon taxes do achieve a double dividend, positive impact on economic growth and emissions reductions, in the long term. Distribution considerations require that tax revenues are recycled in a way that protect monetarily poor households. Apart from the practical work already discussed up to this point, including most notably the modeling applications discussed in Adams and Parmenter, 2013, the next section highlights two other carbon tax CGE modeling applications from South Africa, a country that has since adopted a carbon tax similar in design to that discussed in these papers. Using an adapted version of the classic Orani model for South Africa, this paper provided one of the first comprehensive CGE-based studies of a carbon tax in South Africa. Various revenue recycling options were tested to prove that a triple dividend, reducing emissions, increasing growth, 
and reducing poverty is possible in the long run. In a follow-up to this paper, Van Heerden et al., 2016, conducted a similar modeling exercise but using a dynamic CGE model in calibrating the shocks to the actual proposed carbon tax rates on specific commodities. The findings of the research confirm the case for carbon taxes in delivering a triple dividend, although concerns about the adjustment path and a so-called just transition remain a challenge. The paper from Arndt et al., 2014, is complementary to the Van Heerden et al., 2006 paper. It also investigates the introduction of a carbon tax in South Africa, using a slightly different CGE model based on the classic Dervis et al., 1982, implementation. The findings and exposition of the modeling makes for an interesting comparison to the work published in the two Van Heerden papers. The findings are generally similar in that the research supports the implementation of a carbon tax for South Africa. This is the end of the module content. Here are a couple of concluding remarks. The last three decades have seen a major shift in the climate debate, which has led to the emergence of environmental economics as one of the most important branches in economic study. Various Nobel Prizes across different fields, including most recently Nordhaus for his integrated economic analysis of climate change, the environmental and the economy, have been rewarded for work on this topic. Starting from credible scientific evidence, CIPCC reports, facts and data on climate change and emissions, and linking these to economic models that are capable of analyzing the impacts of mitigation policies, such as CGE or IAMs, are crucial to find the best policies and transition paths to a lower carbon and environmentally sustainable future at both a national and global level. Various such models and examples were discussed in this module and participants are encouraged to consult the recommended reading list for more examples. Environmental economics is a field of real-world importance that will only become more critical in the coming years. We wish you good luck and many hours of enjoyment in navigating the numerous interesting resources and literature related to environmental economics. The key to environmental economics is that there is value from the environment and value from the economic activity. The goal is to balance the economic activity with environmental degradation by taking all costs and benefits into account. Global emissions will continue rising if we don't take action.